Hi, I'm Jude from HeadFi.org, and on the last episode of HeadFi TV, we talked about some products that were going to be launched or introduced at CanJam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011. Well, CanJam at RMAF happened last week, so in this episode, we're going to talk about some of the things that stole the show. Several people came up to me at the show to ask me what my choice for product of the show would be. And that was an easy, fast answer. The Sennheiser RS220 is an easy choice for me. And in fact, if you asked me what my choice for product of the year would be, head Fi product of the year, it would still be the Sennheiser RS220. It's a remarkable headphone in that obviously it's wireless, but it gives wired type performance. A lot of headphones have promised this. This is the only one that truly delivers. And in fact, it's the only wireless headphone or the first wireless headphone I would recommend as a primary headphone. Um, it's that good. Now, how does it sound? It sounds like a wireless HD600. Now, an HD600, as many head fires know, can scale up to world-class performance if you put it in the right system. And it doesn't quite have the HD600 at its best, but what it sounds like is a well-driven HD600 in a good system. But that it does that wirelessly is truly astonishing. Um, why is this so significant? Why would I make it so important a pick, in my opinion? It's because it opens up certain realms of thinking and possibility that I wouldn't have previously thought of. So now I ask the question, how far are we from a wireless HD800 or a wireless LCD2 or a wireless um, HE6? This really opens the floodgates to what wireless is potentially capable of being. Um, so this was a, a milestone type product. I'll always remember the RS220 as the first wireless headphone that I could recommend as a primary headphone. It's that good. One of the biggest surprises of the show had to be Vmoda's presence there and the response to them. Um, let me explain. Vmoda is a company that has not been known for making audiophile type headphones. What they've been known for and what they've had tremendous success doing is making premium priced, premium build quality fashion headphones. And they've been doing it longer than Monster's been doing it with Beats. So they're veterans at that. But now they're adding to their game. They are now targeting the audiophile market with respect to the sound signature. So they're combining the looks of their headphones with the audiophile friendly sound signature that a lot of us would want uh, from our headphones in the HeadFi community and that frankly a lot of the consumers in the mainstream market maybe haven't previously been exposed to. Their first effort targeting the audiophile type sound signature is the Crossfade M80. I think it's been a tremendous early success for them. Uh, it's already one of my favorite portable over-ear headphones and you'll see similar responses by a lot of the owners of them uh, on HeadFi.org in our forums. So they're off to a great start, and there are more products like this coming. Why is this so substantial from an industry standpoint? Most head fires, myself included, are sound first. That's what we want. We care about sound more than anything. And we're willing to go out in public with headphones that look silly on our heads in public. Uh, we don't really care. A lot of head fires don't anyway. And I'm, again, I'm one of them. I'll go out with sure SRH 840s on my head, even though it makes me look like a Teletubby. Um, but most people won't do that. If we want to expose people to great sounding headphones, um, outside of the HeadFi community, which is the larger community, they have to look good. These are substantial. They're, they're substantial accessories. They go around our necks, on top of our heads, and most people would want them to look good. Vmoda is doing this now with an audiophile type sound signature. Sennheiser, Biodynamic, AKG companies, uh, most respected in the audiophile community, have to pay close attention to what they're doing. I think they're going to have to make some better looking headphones. So. Big surprise, Vmoda's presence and the positive impressions they got at the show. As many a HeadFi regular knows, planar magnetic headphones have really just surged in the last couple years as far as driving uh, the, the outer limits of uh, dynamic headphone development. And one of the best of them is the Hi-Fi Man HE6. The problem with the HE6 is though, it is inordinately difficult to drive. Um, pair it with most amps and it, my, in, in my opinion, to my ears, sounds a bit thin and reedy. Um, but then you pair it with something like the Dark Star, which no other amp, by the way, pairs with the HE6 as well as the Dark Star. You pair it with the Dark Star, and it just brings out a whole different headphone. Most people that were listening to that rig were shocked, the ones that were familiar with the HE6, at what it was capable of. So the HE6 is one of the best headphones in the world. It just needs something like the Dark Star to drive it. Now, the Dark Star is priced at about $3,000, but that rig was one of the best in show. What makes the Dark Star so good at driving the HE6? I believe it's probably the most powerful, commercially available, he dedicated headphone amp in the world 
at this time. I, I can't think of anything more powerful than it right now. So uh, that helps. But again, it just commands tremendous performance. It fills in the bass, gives it some nice bloom. Uh, uh, and then you, of course, have the HE6's uh, legendary treble. And, and it just does what you want the HE6 to do, but through most other amps, it just can't. So that combo was definitely one of the best of show. Ray Samuels Audio also makes one of the most powerful portable headphone amplifiers, the SR71B. It's been available for quite some time now, and it's really one of the only commercially available portable headphone amplifiers that can drive something like the HiFam NHE6 with any amount of authority, uh, just something most portable amps can't do. And it's remained relatively unchallenged in that market. It's fully balanced input to output. ALO Audio, though, introduced the RX Mark III at Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011. And it represents what I consider to be the best challenge to the SR71B I've seen so far, and in some ways even trumps it. So it's also fully balanced input to output, but it has a bass control that actually helps fill in the HE6 and makes it sound bigger. Now I know you think bass control and you're thinking like the old style uh, receivers, uh, stereo receivers that had treble and bass controls and how bad most of those were. But we're talking about a bass control on the RX Mark III that really only affects the bass. It had minimal, if any, impact on mid-range. It was truly wonderful at, at just controlling bass. And I really enjoyed the RX Mark III prototype that I had for a while, and I heard it at the show, and it's even better and more refined at the show, and I think more refinements are still coming before it hits final production. But what a wonderful portable headphone amplifier. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that one introduced to the market. That's the ALO Audio RX Mark III. When I think about ALO Audio and its founder, Ken Ball, I can't help but think about Cypher Labs, because Ken is also a part of Cypher Labs. And Cypher Labs makes the Algorithm Solo, which is an iDevice DAC. Now, a lot of people came up to me to ask about iDevice DACs. In fact, other than the Odyssey LCD3, no product type was asked about more of me than those things. Even in the panel, I think somebody brought it up. So iDevice DAC seem to be of great interest to the audiophile community to try to maximize sound quality from a portable system. So the Cypher Labs Algorithm Solo uh, uh, made, I think, a substantial impact at the show, as did the Fostex HPP-1. Both, again, are iDevice type DACs. The HPP-1 adds a built-in headphone amplifier, um, but I think you'll be seeing more iDevice type DACs and some really exciting products uh, that have iDevice DAC functionality going forward. While on the topic of portable audio gear, I have to discuss the JH Audio JH3A, which a lot of people have been curious about. It's a product that was introduced about a year and a half ago in prototype form in Chicago Can Jam, and it was met with tremendous excitement and a lot of pre-orders. It's since changed in its design uh, rather substantially between then and now, and a lot of people are wondering, does it still sound as magical as it did before? I was wondering the same thing, to be honest with you. The answer to that question, to my ears, is yes. I didn't have the two to compare side to side, but I have heard the JH3A in its previous uh, form uh, several times, including recently in a meeting with Jerry uh, Harvey up here in Detroit when he came up here uh, on a tour stop. So um, I have heard the previous JH3A on, on several occasions. I do think this current one is every bit as magical. Now, I actually am more likely, though, to order the current version more likely than I was to order the previous one. Let me explain why. I never put a pre-order in for the first JH3A, and I'm seriously considering putting one in for this one. There's a key difference. So you get the performance, in my, in my opinion, to my ears, that you had with the previous JH3A. But with the current configuration, the earpieces are no longer married to the box, to the amp DAC crossover stuff. In the first version, it was. You couldn't use one without the other. You always had to carry both if you wanted to use it. But with this, through a simple adapter setup, you can use the JH16 earpieces that come with it as an independent set of custom in-ear monitors with any of your portable gear, or any of your gear, really, that can drive a headphone. And that, to me, is a deal maker, potentially, for me, whereas the marriage of the two devices was kind of a deal killer for me and enough for me not to place an order before, whereas, again, I'm seriously considering placing one now. So I just wanted to say that it was easily one of the best sounds of show, the JH3A system at Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011. And if you're worried about the magic of the 3A, I don't think you have anything to worry about. And the opinions seem pretty universally consistent with that uh, from those who listen to it. So far, I've talked about some of the best sounding systems at the show. But now the question is, what was the best sounding headphone or system, regardless of price, at Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011? 
The answer to that one is still pretty simple for me. If you remember back to HeadFi TV episode 8, we talked about the Stax SR009. In that episode, I called it the best sounding headphone to my ears that I've ever heard. And that's still true. Uh, it was in two different systems at CanJam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest. It was uh, with the Woot Audio WES that I used uh, here at my office to do that episode and that I lived with for quite a while. Uh, what a wonderful rig to live with. But it was also paired with the Headamp Blue Hawaii Special Edition. Um, and out of both of those systems, there are some differences in signature between the two systems, but out of both, the SR009 is still sublime, stunning, more revealing than any other headphone I've ever heard. Just phenomenal. So, so best sound of show, regardless of price, either of the two SR009 systems. Um, just expect to part with about $11,000 for either of those systems because it's $5,200 um, for the headphone. It's $5,000 for a, a, a Blue Hawaii Special Edition from Headamp and um, $5,000 for a stock uh, WES. But if you start getting into fancy tubes and things like that, uh, expect the price to go up. So between ten dollars and $11,000 will get you what I think is the best sounding headphone system uh, I've yet heard. Some of you are going to think I'm a little nutty for what I'm about to say. I'm about to name what I think is the best value of Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011. And what I'm about to select is a headphone that's priced at nearly $2,000. It is the Audazy LCD3, priced at $1,945. And it is, to me, the best value of Can Jam at RMAF. Why? Because of all the headphones currently made, there's only one that I would take over the Odyssey LCD3, and that's the Stax SR009. Um, it is just that good. It's everything that the Odyssey LCD2 is, but better in every way. And it has bass that's better than any headphone, to my ears, any headphone I've ever heard, living or dead, um, uh, in terms of texture, detail, impact. The bass on this is standard setting. Frankly, if I could cut and paste the base from this to an SR009, I'd have something akin to uh, the Uber headphone, the, 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 the ultimate headphone. Um, but that's how good the base is on this. But it's also remarkably detailed. The driver is all new. A much, much lighter diaphragm than in the LCD2 and just an all new driver. So lest you think because it looks like an LCD2 that it essentially is one, it is not. Um, it uses an all new driver. Yes, the style is relatively similar nearly identical, uh, different wood, much softer cushions, uh, brown leather instead of black, uh, new cable guides on the earpieces. But other than that, um, you know, it does look a lot like an LCD2. But do not be fooled into thinking it is an LCD2 Rev3. It's not. All new driver, and you can hear it when you listen to it. Um, I've had the great benefit of being able to take this one home. Uh, this one's going to be mine, by the way, um, and I'll probably, don't be surprised if I buy another because uh, uh, they're kind of heavy to carry around, but that's how good it is. What a wonderful headphone, the Odyssey LCD3, best value of the show. So those are some of the things that I think stole the show at Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011, but that wasn't everything. So in the next episode, we're actually going to discuss a few more things from Can Jam at RMAF 2011, but we're also going to talk about the Tokyo Headphone Festival, which I'm going to this coming Saturday. So in the next episode, look for some footage and coverage of the Tokyo Headphone Festival and also Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011, some more coverage from there. Thanks for watching this episode. We'll see you next time.